principle, but in practice uh, still comprises it. Uh, plus, because we're so close to the black hole, uh, DR is important, and this is true not just in the last stages, where gravitational waves are produced in the Lisa band, but also much earlier, uh, the classical <coughs> precession of the carryouts, the Einstein precession of the perihelion in the case of the solar system, turns out to be extremely important in limiting or affecting how rapidly problem that mixes together lots of things which aren't always or usually mixed together. So let me start by <coughs> talking very simply about orbits. Here's an orbit around a black hole, uh, which may be destined to become an memory. It's an eccentric orbit. If I uh, have just a black hole, the orbit looks like that forever. It never gets into the black hole. If I uh, assume that the black hole is embedded in a spherical star cluster, then the radial force is no longer inverse square, and the orbit precesses. Uh, this is the Newtonian precession of the curry, curry apps, I guess you would say. And here's the equation that gives the precession rate, mu sub t. It's uh, given by the radial frequency, 2 pi over the radius period, uh, times a term that depends on how much mass there is inside the orbit compared to the black hole mass, that's m star. And finally, a term that depends on the eccentricity of the orbit, functional form there uh, depends on the distribution of the mass, what the density profile of the mass is, but uh, in general, this function goes to zero for very eccentric orbits. Eccentric orbits precess very slowly uh, in spite of the distributed mass around the black hole. And that turns out to be important because if the precession is slow, the orbit sits there for a long time and it's easy to change it, as I'll show. Well, if you'd like to get that star or that black hole into the big black hole, we have to change the eccentricity of the orbit as implied the torque. The torque is a rate of change of angular momentum, which in this case means eccentricity. Um, where would that torque come from? Well, I'm going to focus in this talk on time-independent torques, torques due to some unchanging mass distribution. It will become clear why in a moment. So one possible source for a torque is to assume that the star cluster around the black hole is non-spherical. Non-radial forces due to the distribution of mass. For instance, if it's a triaxial nucleus, that's the sort of most general uh, regular form for a non-spherical cluster. The torques are of this order, g times the total mass over the radius, with a term that describes how flat the distribution is. You can think of these as being the moments of inertia in the, uh, let's say, short and long axis of the triaxial cluster. So for a spherical cluster, this is zero. For a very elongated one, it's of order one. There's one possible source of torque that can change eccentricity. Another is this uh, idea of resonant relaxation, which I'm sure you'll hear more about, but let me just introduce it. The idea is that even if the cluster is spherical, if n, the number of stars, is finite, which it certainly is in this case, then there's going to be more stars on this side than that side at any given time. Furthermore, because the orbits are nearly Keplerian, they tend to remain in fixed orientation for long periods of time. So this produces a torque as well, due to the discreteness of the, the distribution of points. And that's the uh, origin of what's called resonant relaxation. So in both of these cases, you can think of the torques as being more or less fixed in time, at least over some length of time. Now, in this picture, if we want to reduce the angular momentum to effectively zero, uh, it has to happen in a time less than the precession time. Because if you think about it, orbit's precessing, the direction of the torques is going to change sort of periodically over the precession. You can't continually torque the orbit in the same direction unless you follow it. Right? That's not going to happen here. So these torques have to do their job in a time less than the precessional period. Okay? And that puts a condition on the eccentricity, which is easy to derive. In other words, only eccentric orbits, orbits with low angular momentum or high eccentricity, are going to change their eccentricity in the precession time enough to become radial and go into the black hole. And there's the condition uh, as it looks in the case that the torques are produced by triaxial uh, mass distribution. So eccentric orbits not only precess very slowly, which allows the torques to build up longer, but they have less distance to go in eccentricity space to reach an eccentricity of one. So for both reasons, highly eccentric orbits uh, satisfy this 
time and depend on the torques. So if we look at the orbit, it starts, it turns out, on the short axis of the mass distribution. It's precessing due to the distributed mass as before, but because of the torques, the angular momentum is steadily decreasing, and at that point, the orbit becomes radial. It goes right through the black hole. Now, you can't see it here, but what happens mathematically is the direction of circulation of the orbit reverses at that point. It's kind of a singular point, not really very physical. And because the mass precession direction depends on how the orbit is circulating, that reverses too, and it goes back the other way. And now the effect of those torques is, is opposite because the sign of the angular momentum is opposite, so it gets rounder again. So you go back and forth between the two limits. So in this case, the star would go into the black hole already in one precession time, right there. Okay. But in general, you would have precession in more than just one plane. Here's the more general case of uh, a precessing orbit in a 3D triaxial cluster. Uh, here's the apex where the black hole is, and the orbit precesses along the, the uh, long and intermediate axes of the triaxial figure. The points of zero angular momentum are these four corners. If you look at this orbit from underneath, projected, the uh, track traced out by the uh, apo apse position of the orbit is shown here, an x and y. Here are the four corners where the angular momentum is zero. It's kind of a list of two figures, so uh, it takes formally infinitely long for it to reach any particular point. But if you imagine there's some region around the corners which corresponds to orbits that are nearly zero angular momentum and therefore can come close enough to the black hole, um, it's going to reach those regions uh, predictably uh, from time to time uh, as it processes in the two directions. So just a word about these kinds of orbits, which haven't been talked about very much, but are probably important. Uh, as you saw in the examples I just showed, they're integrable. They aren't necessarily chaotic, which is kind of surprising because they come so close to the black hole. Um, they aren't the only orbits that you would have in such a system. Uh, this plot shows as a function of distance from the black hole and units of the influence radius, a uh, typical distribution. So near the black hole, you would have the eccentric orbits being these pyramids, but also orbits that circulate around because they're less eccentric. The two orbits, that's what the T stands for. And if you go out even farther, some of these do become chaotic. And finally, um, the time for a star on such an orbit to find its way into the very center can be long, depending on the parameters of the problem. In other words, you don't necessarily empty these orbits very quickly because you've got these two precessions and it takes a long time for the star to find the uh, low angular momentum orbit. All right, that was all classical stuff, uh, or I should say all Newtonian dynamics of W relativity now. So here's the equation for the mass precession that I've been talking about. In addition, if you turn on GR, there's another precession, the Einstein precession of the periapse, which is opposite in, in sense. And more importantly, it depends very strongly on the eccentricity. So recall that for the mass precession, uh, eccentric orbits precess very slowly. But in the case of GR, if you fix the size of the orbit, the more eccentric ones precess much faster because they come closer to the black hole where the GR is more, uh, more important. Because the orbits I've been talking about always eventually reach eccentricity of 1, then it's guaranteed that GR will turn on at some point. show this, I'll first just define some, some parameters. The uh, dimensionless parameter that determines the, the, the size of, of GR is, is what I'll call kappa. It's basically the ratio of the precession rate from GR for a roundish orbit to the precession rate due to um, uh, the mass distribution, which you can see here. The other two important parameters are the angular momentum, which I'm going to write in a dimensionless form, little l, that's just one minus x and the terms that describe the degree of torque from the background distribution. Uh, there's two of them for a triaxial ellipsoid. I, I may just call them epsilon uh, and ignore the fact that there's two. So here's an orbit where that GR term is very small. It's almost the same, but it has this nice uh, asymmetric pendant. I think Tal Alexander has christened, christened these orbits. He calls them windshield wiper orbits. <laughs> I think nowadays windshield wipers don't look like this. Maybe in the old days they did. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if we're showing our age by, by calling them that. So what's happening here? 
by possessing, due to the mass term, as before, the torques are making it more eccentric, there comes a time when it's so eccentric that now the GR precession is beginning to dominate. And notice it doesn't become completely radial, because when the GR turns on, that precession is in the opposite direction, so it takes it back. Okay. Now, you couldn't see it, but um, because the orbit didn't reverse its sense of circulation, the torques continue to make it more eccentric. It reached its maximum eccentricity here and not here. And then became less eccentric, at which point the GR precession turns off, so to speak, and the mass precession takes over again. And this plot shows the eccentricity versus time and the angle of the periapsis versus time. So kind of uh, remarkably, the, both the maximum and the minimum eccentricity for this orbit are reached at the same point when it crosses the short axis, although in different phases. The basic point here is <coughs> that GR limits how small the how large the eccentricity can become, because when you reach that critical value, um, you suddenly precess much more rapidly due to GR, which doesn't allow the torques to go up any longer. Would that still be true if the orientation had weren't and it were somewhere were, were, were rotated relative to the, the no, potential? The, the torques only work in the right sense if, in this case if you start along the short axis. Or if it would start other places would become would belong to other channels and start to circulate. If I increase that GR term, now it precesses uh, not as far before the GR turns on because the GR is low. This is like making the orbit smaller, closer to the black hole for the same initial eccentricity. So the minimum angular momentum or the maximum eccentricity is not as extreme as it was before. The GR is limiting it even more. If I increase kappa again, now I'm close to the critical value at which the GR precession rate just matches the mass precession rate. And because they have opposite signs, they can cancel. And they're almost doing so here with very little change in eccentricity. <coughs> if I turn up GR even more, now I'm dominated by GR precession always. And this is an example uh, I alluded to earlier. The torques have very little chance to build up here. They're changing signs so rapidly that there's very little evolution in terms of angular momentum. <coughs> and if I do this in, in three dimensions too, um, the orbits look sort of like pyramids, but there's now these two different uh, parts of the trajectory reflected here, and you do sometimes find chaos associated with the GR term, but most of what I'll have to say is, uh, is, is independent of that. <coughs> so <coughs> the crucial point is that GR limits the eccentricity. Uh, remember how that happened. The maximum eccentricity occurs here, so it recesses, the GR turns on, drives you the other way, uh, eccentricity continues to increase to maximum value there, and it's not hard to think that there's a relation between this eccentricity and that eccentricity, and there is. The minimum value is given in terms of the maximum value like that. It's an inverse relation, which is surprising. In other words, the rounder the orbit is here, the more elongated it becomes when it comes back, because it's able to recess farther before turning around. Okay. So this is uh, the lowest angular momentum reachable by a particular orbit. If I want to make this as small as I can, in other words, what's the global minimum in eccentricity of, in angular momentum that I can reach for all orbits, then I would want to increase this as much as possible. But if I increase it too much, the orbit just recesses all the way around and doesn't do this. Uh, so that's an upper limit on the initial L, the same one I derived before <coughs> here in orbit. So if I combine that limit on the initial L with this condition, I have a sort of global minimum um, of the angular momentum uh, for orbits of a given size. And this depends very nicely on the three things it must depend on, the GR precession, the mass precession, and the degree of torque from the background triaxial distribution. OK. So just a summary so far. The nucleus with a fixed torque, which I've modeled as a triaxial uh, background system. Uh, GR precession places an upper limit on the eccentricity, which is given by a very simple relation. Uh, another way to say this, if you didn't like that derivation, is that if you exceed that eccentricity, um, the orbit precesses so rapidly to the GR that there's no time to 
And you can restate this condition, if you like, in this way as well, uh, for an orbit that's at the critical eccentricity, the change in L due to this force in one precession time is just the order L. So the eccentricity can change uh, by the order units in that time. OK, so let me now talk about resonant relaxation, which uh, you recall was uh, the other context that I mentioned that has basically fixed torques over some length of time. So again, the idea here is that um, in a Keplerian system, which a black hole nearly is, the orbits have more or less fixed orientations over some long time, a order of precession time. So you can think of them as uh, rings or annuli uh, over which the uh, mass is some average uh, of the mass given by the single particle on that orbit. But they're fixed. And so they produce a more or less fixed torque, which turns out to, to vary in this way with the number of, of stars. And if you imagine that torque acting on the angular momentum, then just as before, it produces a change. Uh, the difference here is that the coefficient here is determined by the resonant relaxation torque and not by the fractional torque. Uh, for those who are experts in the audience, I'm talking about coherent resonant relaxation regimes, not the, uh, the random. So if this ignores GR, suppose I include GR. Remember I said that there's a, a maximum eccentricity that can be reached when you allow GR precession to turn on. Can you make a prediction of what that implies in the context of resonant relaxation? In other words, how great can the eccentricity get if the torques are coming from the Rugen fluctuations of all the stars? And I'm going to do this by just equating the torques in the resonant relaxation case with the torques in the triaxial mass distribution. They're very similar relations. Notice if I assume that the triaxial parameter is 1 over square root of n, then these two match. I'm going to make the odds odds that I can predict what's going to happen in the resonant relaxation case based on my simple orbit calculations if I replace the triaxial algae by 1 over square root of n. If I do that, my formula for the maximum eccentricity just becomes this. And again, it depends on the uh, GR term, the mass precession term, and now a term that depends on the number of particles in the system because that's what determines the torque in the resonant relaxation case. And finally, let's talk about memory. parameters that define the Keplerian orbit, the eccentricity, 1 minus e. So the centric orbits are over here, round orbits are here. Here's the semi-major axis in parsecs. <coughs> and this plot is made for a black hole mass of a million solar masses. Um, this line here is uh, the radius at, of the last stable orbit. It's at uh, a few Torchfield radii. Uh, so this is a line of constant periat, constant peritent. Um, the idea is that uh, most um, stellar black holes, let's say compact objects, start off their life here somewhere with eccentricities of order 0 or 0 0.5, but they scatter off of other things, uh, other black holes, for instance, and the most rapid scattering will occur in this direction, in angular momentum, because angular momentum is already getting small and so making it even smaller. It takes place in a shorter time than the time to scattering energy. So what you're seeing here is effectively a random walk on some scattering time scale back and forth. Now it's possible if the scattering is very fast to scatter directly onto a plunge orbit, in which case the black hole is gone in one order period with a burst, a single burst of gravitational waves. That's not so interesting to Lisa people who would like the gravitational waves to continue over many, many cycles. For that to happen, the scattering has to be efficient, but, but not so efficient that you do that. In other words, you have to approach that line more slowly in such a way that the gravitational wave time can become shorter than the scattering time. And then, of course, you uh, shrink the orbit with roughly fixed pericenter. That's why this track is parallel to that track, all the way down to the Lisa band. And so those are what we will define as the so let me now show you 
body simulations of this process. Here's just a summary of what you're going to see. Uh, these are n-body systems with one supermassive black hole and 50 stellar mass black holes. They're rather massive. That was done to get the time scale as feasible for computation. I know that these black holes aren't that big, but if you'd like, you can uh, reduce this by a factor of five and that by a factor of five and rescale everything. Initially, they have a one over r squared distribution around the black hole. Uh, in this range of radii, that's a milliparsec MPC. Um, we use this integrator, which is fantastically accurate, thanks to my co-author, and includes GR at this level. So both the gravitational wave terms and the uh, lower order PN terms, which of course are responsible for the projections, which are so important. And the code defined the black hole was captured if it came at any time within this mini Schwarzschild radii of the black hole. So both rapid plunges and slow in spirals would occur. Let me first show a movie on that same plane. This is time in years. Each of these is one star. You can see they're scattered in each other negative momentum. And this simulation has no GR. So stars are sometimes scattered by other stars on the plunge orbits, and they're captured. You can see them go into the uh, red one. It's going to be captured there. There. There it goes. Maybe that's where the relaxation actually is. Not that's the scatter. It's a coherent one-way trip to the black hole. I would still call it scattering. Yes, but that's a good point. What's producing the scattering here is this coherent, semi-coherent process called resonance relaxation. Uh, how, how long are the lines in time? So the lines I don't are, remember. Sorry. Enough to make me look good. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to figure it out. It's like 10,000 years, maybe. Is it <laughs> right. But as, as Hal said, and I should emphasize that, the, the mechanism that's dominating the evolution here is not sort of classical relaxation. It's this resonance relaxation, which has a much shorter time scale. But the classical two-body Spitzer relaxation time for this system is a few million years, which we haven't gotten to yet. The whole simulation goes a little over that time. The scattering and incrementum is taking place much more rapidly. And by the end of the simulation, which is I think 10 to the seventh years, about half of the stars have scattered themselves into the black hole, but all on plunge orbits because there's no GR here to suck them in. Now, here's the same thing where I've added all the GR terms. And I'll just make one point before turning it on. This is that criterion that I belabored over uh, the minimum eccentricity that a star can reach given its semi-major atoms. <coughs> Notice that a couple of, I should say stars, black holes, stellar black holes, a couple of the stellar black holes start inside that. They have higher eccentricities at the start, and they're going to stay there. But what I want you to notice is how well the stars that are outside that region, less eccentric stars, respect that boundary. They do know about it. even at the 1 p.m. level, is crucially important because notice this big gap here that stars are avoiding, and black holes are avoiding. This star temporarily got over the boundary. This one is going to become an emery. It escaped. It's now undergoing continued scattering back and forth. In a moment, it'll come close enough to there. That's the only one you're going to see. The emery rate is much lower than what you would naively predict based on how rapidly things in the previous movie uh, evolved to this line, and that might be puzzling that <laughs> So let me show it once more, and just emphasize what's going on as, as uh, stars evolve to high eccentricities, the GR precession time becomes so short that they're just precessing wildly, and the torts from the other stars no longer Why does this one escape the boundary? Well, there is other relaxation going on besides resonant relaxation. And that's a very vague statement which I don't really feel comfortable with. Maybe Tal will elaborate in his talk tomorrow. <laughs> but um, you could imagine that just the fact that there are discrete stars uh, will sometimes lead to a close encounter, uh, which isn't, isn't well described by resonant relaxation formalism. And, and that's presumably what's causing these rare animals. This just summarizes a, a bunch of such simulations, my last slide, I think. This shows, over time, the uh, time average rate, in other words, the average over times up to the time plotted of events 
sponges or emeries. So in the first movie, that's this plot here, there was no GR, so no emeries. The sponge rate was high and drops off slowly over time because you're losing black holes into big black hole. I didn't show this, but if I add just the dissipative GR term, this 2.5 PM term, then I get some emeries. But only a small fraction of the total events are emeries. If I then add the full GR, and that was my second movie, sponges have gone almost to zero. That's because of that barrier. Uh, and the emery rate is, is somewhat smaller than it was uh, in the absence of the 1 and 2 PM terms. Um, what I'm showing here is that if I were to naively compute the emery rate based on kind of standard theory, like the theory that Kyle will talk about, I find a much larger number. In other words, the simulation seemed to show that the emery rate is rather lower, maybe a factor of 5 or 10, than you would conclude based on standard formulae for this problem. Um, I've been debating with Kyle what this means for several days, and we still don't know. I believe the result. It's robust <coughs> in an body sense, uh, but I'm not sure what it means uh, physically. Presumably, it has something to do with distribution of points near this boundary, because that's what determines how rapidly they're going to, or how often they're going to escape over the boundary. And that's a regime that hasn't really been studied up to now, so I wouldn't be too surprised if the existing treatments don't catch the, uh, the physics. With my conclusions, I guess I should add one here, that it's now possible to do the Emory problem with n-body simulations, at least in a modest way. That's some progress. Uh, the n-body simulations confirm that there is this boundary in eccentricity, in retrospect, not too surprising, but really haven't been thought about before uh, in the presence of GR. That means we need some, to do some, some work, understand it. And, and based on what I've seen so far, the emery rates uh, may have been overestimated in the literature by factors like this. Given all the other uncertainties in emery rate calculations, that may not be so impressive. But the dynamical point is that it's lost. here isn't necessarily unrealistic. And physically, I could imagine that million solar mass black holes really only have of order 10 to the 2 stellar mass black holes around them in the region of interest. So it, it may be physically the right regime. We're not too far from it. Um, and second, what I'm worried most about is that the small n, uh, you know, uh, how do I say it, close encounters, uh, which aren't treated in the standard relaxation theory, are probably more important. So the, um, uh, the uh, reason for which you have uh, 50 cell black holes and 10 to the 6 or 5 and 10 to the 5 is because of numerical addressing in the end, but it's called, I, I guess, uh, the mass ratio. Uh, yeah, in other words, I sat down and, and asked, you know, what are the parameters I can take and do a large number of simulations at a finite time, and finite time being a couple of months, and decided that this was a good choice. Uh, I wanted to go for a time long enough that the standard Do you think that uh, this is uh, very sensitive to that particular uh, spec of the problem? I guess all I can say is that in principle, all of the various dynamical processes have an independence, which I think I know. So in principle, I could answer your question, any particular question, by saying if I vary in, you know, the various terms uh, change in terms of the relative size. Uh, so yeah. in principle, yes, it, it does matter. And uh, uh, probably I, I miss it, but. Uh, did, did you talk of what, what is the initial conditions for that particular embody? Uh, it was a uh, density of uh, rho r to the minus 2. Yes. In a range of about 100 in radii. And the distribution of uh, the initial distribution of centricities for the black holes? You were about 5. Okay. Okay, so why do they change the computer so that they somehow?
but the budget and eccentricity changes do you destroy the family of order? So do you still have these kind of differences? So what was the question for you? If the background eccentricity changes with time, how does it affect sure, the uh, family of order? Do you yeah. still get these or do you the, uh, 